So yes, I am Stephanie Wallach. I'm going to jump in. I work out of the Williamsport office for North Penn Legal Services. Uh, anyone who's not aware, I'm sure you all are at this point, but North Penn offers free legal services for specific civil legal matters. Um, we do take pro bono attorneys. So if you're feeling generous to donate your time, we're always welcome to volunteers. Uh, we also offer judicare opportunities for those more time intensive cases like bankruptcy and, and social security cases. So feel free to contact us. The number is gonna be on the last slide. So today, this is our agenda. Um, I understand most people that are listening, you mostly work with landlords, whereas my office mostly works with tenants. Um, but this will be geared towards, honestly, your landlords. These are going to be things that you want to consider when advising and preparing leases and advising your clients about maybe what the consequences of breaches are. So we're going to go through all the controlling statutes you should be aware of, uh, the lease formation and terms. This is almost like a checklist of terms you should include in your, in your lease. Um, we won't get to all 18 of these, but we will get to most of them throughout this PowerPoint. And then everyone's favorite is what to do when you want to terminate a lease. So lease termination will go through, but if it's related to one of these lease terms, I will talk about the case law during the lease terms. All right, first things first, obviously everyone knows the Pennsylvania Landlord Tenant Act of 1951 applies to your residential leases. Um, not much to say on this right now because I will sprinkle in the citations as they're relevant with those lease terms, um, but know that it does cover both residential and commercial leases and does not define what a lease is. So we'll get to that later on as well. Second thing to be aware of for statutes that apply, uh, Holmes case, monumental case for landlord-tenant law, that held that contract law applies to the landlord-tenant relationship. It was the first case to ever do that explicitly. Um, prior to the 70s and 80s, courts were applying real estate law to these kind of relationships. This transformed those cases from real estate realm to the contract law realm. And obviously, I don't need to lecture everyone about contract law. We all made it through law school. Um, but when you're forming a lease, we've had some issues with just the basic formations of contracts. Um, most of the time, this shows up with consideration. Um, there can be found to be a lease or landlord-tenant relationship even when there is no rent being paid. So if you see in the Lasher case, it's been upheld, even though there was no lease, there was no rent paid, there was other consideration exchanged between the parties, and that can give rise to a contractual relationship, push those two parties into a landlord-tenant relationship. So be aware, even if there's an oral lease, dispute among the parties about what truly the obligation the relationship is, there's case law out there that between all these different requirements for a contract that can push them into a landlord-tenant relationship. And then finally, we'll talk more about um, legal subject matter as a requirement for a contract. You can't obviously contract to do illegal things. Um, one of the issues you see pretty often is that landlords try to include in the lease that the tenant is responsible for correcting housing code violations, so your local zoning codes. Those are things that cannot be contracted away. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. I should also note, if you have questions, uh, feel free to stick them in the chat box or bring them up as we go along. Contract law obviously means then the statute of frauds applies. So, Leases are not interest in real estate, but there is specific language in Pennsylvania that if a lease is for greater than three years, there should be a written lease. So it doesn't automatically mean that a lease for three plus years is invalid. Uh, the courts will apply a renewal of a like term 
So that is in the landlord tenant law statute. Um, there is some supporting case law that I'll have further on as well. One people don't always realize applies to drafting leases is the Plain Language Consumer Contract Act. This is Pennsylvania specific. So this act essentially was enacted to ensure that consumers are aware of what they're signing. Um, and this is gonna be applied to residential leases, not your commercial leases, with the idea that residential leases between landlords and tenants might be, be between unsophisticated parties. So you need to use language that they can understand. If you're not using plain language, um, examples of that I have sprinkled throughout the presentation, but things like saying subletting or assignment, but not explaining what that means, um, maybe using words like transfer instead of assignment, um, saying liability instead of sculptory clauses, <laughs> you know, taking down that legalese to a more plain language is required. If a court feels that your residential lease is too wordy, too um, difficult for the average person to understand, you can be in violation of the unfair trade practices and consumer law. Um, and those have some pretty hefty damages that tenants could collect on. So it really is in your best interest when drafting a lease to make it understandable by the parties. Um, and so the unfair trade practice and consumer protection law, another statute to be aware of. Um, this in short, we call the UTCP, UTCP that um, is a federal um, kind of adaption in, in Pennsylvania. Um, it was upheld in the monumental properties case to apply to rent, renting of residential housing. Um, there is a nice catch-all provision that says any, uh, any unfair methods of competition. Um, there's a nice list in that law um, that goes through what types of practices, consumer practices that are applied under this law or fall under it. And at the end, there's one that just kind of says anything unfair to the consumer. Um, and that's one of the places where a lot of times this lease, residential leases will fall under if there's a serious repeated um, issue between the landlord and tenant. You should be aware that this doesn't apply the other way around. So it won't apply to a landlord because they're not the consumer in this situation. They might be in other situations, but it is specifically landlord to tenant. Um, and these are the damages here listed, the one through six that a consumer tenant can collect on if they're found, the landlord's found in violation of UTPCP. So some things are pretty obviously average court costs reasonable damages, um, but treble damages. So it really, if there's an issue with returning the security deposit, repeated issues of demanding and not replying, we can request treble damages. So that's me triple that security deposit, um, which can get pretty hefty because nowadays, you know, a monthly rent is going to be $1,000 and we're going to be able to ask for $3,000. So this is the violation for the damages for the UTCPC and also the Plain Language Act. Um, another, we're not gonna go into detail a lot about this because we just don't have the time today, um, but MACRA, the Manufactured Home Community Rights Act, um, this is for mobile home parks um, with three or more mobile homes within that community and that the renters in the situation are actually the owner of that trailer or a mobile home unit. Um, so if you have a landlord coming to you asking for a lease, this is something to be aware of when you're trying to prepare leases because there are extensively more requirements in a mobile home park. Um, there's gonna be extended notice to quit periods. There's a lot of rules about what's required in park rules and posting those and posting the notice requirements. Um, so just being aware if a landlord's coming to you saying, I want to evict this person, get some details about what kind of homes they own and what the area looks like. 
And this is going to be, yeah, for the homeowner. So they have to have a title. The, the renters are maybe renting a lot, but they own the title to that property. Um, it gets a little dicey when you have like a rent to own agreement, um, for a rent to own for that mobile home. So that's a separate, separate CLE we could do. <laughs> um, we will give a couple minutes here for the first poll. If Tim, you could put that up. And you will have to respond to the poll, yes or no, either way, you'll still get credit. <laughs> Okay, so the Fair Housing Act, federal law, um, you might think this doesn't really apply to you because your landlord coming to you is not the housing authority, um, but the Fair Housing Act doesn't apply to any landlord who owns three or more rental units, um, so long as not, he's not one of the three in the building. But if he's one of the four, this will apply. Um, and most of the time we see this violation or issues going on with this um, when the landlord refuses to rent to somebody based on their race, color, religion, sex, family status, or national origin, um, but also when they go to advertise the property, um, especially living sometimes where there's uh, colleges, landlords will put out notices saying they don't want to rent to frat boys, you know, they don't want four boys in this unit, they want a mix, who knows what. Um, that can be a violation of the Fair Housing Act because you're discriminating then on the basis of sex. So, or we also often see this um, when people say, I can't fit, you know, I'm, I'm not doing families. I don't want any small kids running on the second story of this apartment. It's gonna upset my other tenants. Well, if you're just saying no to all kids, that's discrimination based on family status. So this is, you know, I don't, I already can hear it. Um, this is different than zoning laws, right? So if your local ordinances or zoning laws say that you have a family of five, you have to have at least three bedrooms, that's different than saying, I don't want any families. Um, so as long as the family fits within the zoning restrictions or the local ordinances, that's fine. Um, if they don't, that's fine but it's when you do a blanket refusal based on these categories that it's gonna run into issues. And then finally, um, I will mention statutes to be considered of is subsidized housing. So this is gonna be um, public housing. So that's things owned by HUD, assisted housing. Those are gonna be your voucher section eight programs and a lot of things to be aware of that we don't always see um, is for LIHTC. And LIHTC is low income housing tax credit properties. Um, it's pretty obvious when you have HUD or the local housing authority as your landlord, clearly these extra protections that fall under that apply to that landlord. Um, it's less clear when you have LIHTC housing. And this is gonna be that landlord is receiving um, a tax credit or like a subsidy to offer housing at a lower rate than what the fair housing rate is for the area. So this will oftentimes be more like some sort of corporation or LLC who's running one of these. But if they come to you as a landlord trying to evict a tenant, they have an extensively more <laughs> specific language to use for leases, eviction, um, and everything in between. So be wary if you have a tax credit landlord coming to you for help. There's gonna be things outside of this presentation that are required. Okay, on to the good part. So lease formation and lease terms. Um, this is gonna be all those 18 uh, checklists I had at the beginning under the agenda. Um, these are things to think of and be aware of when you're drafting leases or advising clients who may want to evict tenants. Um, and also for tenants and their rights against their landlord, um, we'll cover both in this. So like under the contract law, uh, the Pennsylvania Landlord Tenant Act does not clearly define what a lease is or is not. Um, if you have a written lease, the court is going to look at what's within the borders of that contract. If 
you have a very sad lease. <laughs> I mean, you know, the landlord didn't come to you when they wrote it, but they're coming to you now when they're trying to evict a tenant. They're going to look more at the actions of the parties and how they've been going, uh, proceeding in between each other during the duration of the lease to look at what kind of rights and duties are applicable. Um, this also can be applied to whether there's a lease or not a lease uh, in hotels and rooming houses. So just because you check into a motel and you're, you know, it clearly says motel on the outside, you're clearly signing a paper that says, you know, here's my weekly rate of $500. Um, it has been held that hotels and different types of rooming houses, and even sometimes um, nursing homes, depending on the situation, those can be fall under the landlord-tenant relationship, and these laws are going to apply to them then. Um, this case here, it's local out of Crawford County, but they cite a Pennsylvania Superior Court case. Great language in there if you're trying to sort out where your landlord and tenant relationship falls in there, if it does at all. I should say that's a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> Um, obviously, every lease should have the name of the parties. The things we get most often with this is what if there's a court order, like a PFA, or the parties are, the tenants are getting divorced, what is the landlord supposed to do? Um, so when both tenants, all tenants sign the lease, they're all equally liable for the duties, covenants, warranties in that lease. Um, you can't normally split up a lease and assign different duties to different tenants. So in the case where there's a divorce, that might be language you want to include in a lease saying what would happen if there's a court filing for a divorce. So that way it gets your landlord out of a sticky situation. Um, same thing with PFAs. So we know it, when temporary orders, temporary PFAs are granted, they usually evict the defendants, at least temporarily. Um, if they're permanently evicted from the home from a final PFA, and any other home you know that plaintiff may live in, it's great to put that language very clearly in a lease saying, if there's a court order that you are evicted from this property, I will remove you from the lease and sign a new lease, something like that. So it's very clear on the parties and very clear for your landlord client what to expect in that situation. Um, your, if a landlord is your client, don't feel um, that the, he's going to have any sort of um, ramifications from a PFA evicting one of the parties, one of the tenants from the home, because um, it is a court order. So your landlord can't violate that and should not, you know, give him extra keys or let him in at another time for that defendant. Um, the other thing we see pretty often is that a rental property is sold by a landlord. So the sale of real estate, if there's a tenant inside that rental, is not a valid eviction reason. There are three reasons for eviction uh, under Pennsylvania statutes. Selling the property is not one of them. So normally if, you're, if your landlord does not do anything, that lease transfers to the new real estate owner upon the sale, that new owner becomes and assumes all the obligations of that former landlord. Um, there is not, specific law out there that they should give notice and like a, not like a foreclosure action where you have to give notice of certain things. Um, but it would be in that new owner or landlord's best interest to do what's called an estoppel certificate. So that's gonna be, it can be a pretty straightforward form, essentially have each new tenant complete it. It's not necessarily a new lease, but in that estoppel certificate, the tenant's going to write out any sort of issues they might have been having with the former landlord. And then that may help your, your new owner of the building assert defenses against that prior owner. Um, so then this goes out with saying, I guess, uh, if there was an existing landlord who sells the building to a new owner, they should transfer any tenant security deposits to that new owner. Okay, so normally we'll talk about security deposits later on, but um, they should be held in a separate escrow account, you know, a separate bank account earning interest um, and just transfer that right over to the new owner. And then that's, you'll have a record of it. And it's not their problem anymore. 
Duration of leases, uh, how long a lease goes for, obviously something you wanna include. Um, if they're not specified, if you just say this lease starts on January 1st, and then it doesn't have an ending point, it doesn't say it's month to month, it doesn't say it's for a year, the courts will uh, presume that it's renewable for the rental payment periods. So if you pay month, uh, rent on the first of each month, it converts to a month to month lease. Um, if, if um, you have a holdover tenant, which is when you know, the lease ended, maybe the landlord said you have to get out, um, that's gonna be the same, same law applying that it's just gonna renew for a like period. Um, if you have a lease that is you know, annual year to year, it will just renew for another year. Um, so be careful in that language and it's best to make it very clear. So that way you're also not in violation of that plain language act. Rent, <laughs> some issues we see with rent, um, partial payment. If a landlord only accepts partial payment, isn't they're not waiving the right to receive that whole month's payment. Uh, we know we see that pretty often. People lose their jobs, have an issue, they can only pay 100 now and they'll pay the rest next week when they get paid. Um, just because your, your landlord accepts partial does not mean they're not entitled to the full monthly. Where it becomes an issue is that if a landlord is consistently accepting rent late, so let's say the lease says it's due on the 1st, your tenant collects social security, so they get paid on that first Friday, which is sometimes the third, the fifth. And so they just accept payment then. The landlord cannot then strictly enforce a lease saying it's not on the first, it's late, I'm evicting you. Uh, there's case law from the Supreme Court that as long as, if they're setting some sort of traditional standard between them, that's what's gonna be applied. Late fees. Um, very common in leases, they're supposed to represent uh, their liquidated damages for that landlord. The extra uh, administrative costs that in, that's involved with paying or having to collect that late rent, late rent um, it's not a penalty. If it's a penalty, you're running into issues under debt collection case law. Um, so if you're trying to collect it as a penalty for being late, um, that can be an issue for your landlord. So make sure it's explicitly stated in your lease that you know this is a liquidated damage. It's um, not some sort of penalty, and they really shouldn't be anything unreasonable or excessive because then they can be considered unconscionable or a contract adhesion. Um, so you know if you're saying it's twenty five dollars a day for every day it's late, that's going to be excessive. If it reflects you know, you have to pay Margie to stay late on Friday to collect the extra rent and type it in and, and check cash it at the bank, whatever her hourly rate is, maybe that would be your reasonable circumstances. Um, other rent uh, language we see often is acceleration. So this is when a tenant leaves, but not before the end of a lease, uh, the landlord can demand for that entire unpaid rental time period to be paid for monthly. Um, that is has been upheld to be valid. You know that's that's legally valid to put that language in a lease. Uh, it only becomes an issue when the landlord tries to accelerate the rent. So um, they're trying to collect for now until the end of the year because that's when the lease was going to go to, and they want to evict the tenant. So there's case laws um, providing that they have to do one or the other. They can either ask for all the rent, or they can evict them. And we will talk about this a little bit more later on. All right, security deposits, so much fun. Um, obviously, most landlords collect some sort of security deposit to make up for wear and tear damages when the unit is vacated. Uh, Pennsylvania landlord tenant law requires it can't be more than two months worth of rent. Most of the time this becomes an issue at the end of the lease, what to do when the tenant moves out. So this holds true for if the tenant is evicted, forced out, or if they leave voluntarily going to be the same law here. So within 30 days after the tenant vacating, uh, usually that means giving the keys over, and the tenant providing a new mailing address. If you don't have the tenant's new mailing address, 
You can save your skin by sending it to their last known address. That will probably be the unit, but they may have a forwarding address with the mail, with you know, the post office. So mailing it to your last known address if they don't give you a new one. Um, you're going to, the landlord has to send some sort of letter saying, here's your security deposit back in full. You know, there's no issue, issues um, or a list of damages and the cost of those damages and how that's being taken out of their security deposit amount. So that damage can even be what the MDJ eviction court grants, you know, your back rent, some, some home damages, but it just has to be written out. If um, you, the landlord fails to do this, the tenant can then go to MDJ court and sue for double the amount of the security deposit. So if rent is 500 a month, they're going back for a thousand. If they pay two months, you know, it can really add up. So just the simple act of making sure your landlords know to follow this afterwards can save them a lot of money. Um, I should also say, if the tenant is living in that unit for two or more years, the landlord has to put that security deposit in an interest bearing account. Um, and it is in best practices to send a statement to the tenant every year every annual year about what the interest is accrued. Um, there is some, some statute about paying out that interest um, during the course of the tenancy, but it's, it's definitely required at the end to pay it along with the security deposit back. And tenants cannot waive this. So you cannot write in the lease that they waive their right to the security deposit. Um, it would be void even if you do include it. Possession, assumed normally in great circumstances, uh, they sign a lease and the landlord hands over possession of the, of the unit. Um, if they're unable to, and that could be because of a natural disaster or there's still the old tenants living there, um, the tenants and the landlords have this no normal contract rights um, to either rescind the contract, you know, cancel it out, restore everyone to their pre-signing conditions, um, they can also get reliance or benefit of the bargain damages. So actual damages are going to be probably just that security deposit paid back. Uh, but benefit of the bargain is going to be also any additional losses suffered by the tenant. So if they had to start staying at a motel at the rate of $50 a night, they could demand that as damages as well. So there's, and that's going to be, um, if there can't be any sort of understanding or force out of the previous tenants. Um, if the unit is totally just, you know, destroyed, fire is usually our top example. Um, it's been held that then neither party, you know, has obligations, at least ceases to exist. If there's partial destruction, um, this is very murky still. So the existing case law was, um, decided prior to the Pruby Holmes case, which obviously established warranty of habitability. But prior case law says that the landlord is not required to rebuild a leased premises. Um, this was before a warranty of habitability. So it is going to depend most likely on the facts of the case and how destroyed and how fixable the unit is. Um, I currently have a case in Lycoming County very similar to this issue. So we'll see um, next January, maybe in a jury trial, what, <laughs> what uh, case law comes out of it. Um, that was for a partial fire destruction. So uh, very much between these two cases. Uh, also under possession, when the tenant moves out, they, it's called two, two different things. They're either gonna surrender it or they're gonna abandon it. So surrender is, tenant no longer living there, no longer exercising any rights of possession. Normally, you know, uh, great circumstances, the landlord accepts this and the tenant's obligation to pay rent terminates, except if there's something special in their lease saying otherwise. If the surrender is not accepted by the landlord, their obligation to pay rent continues. So that kind of situation might be the landlord has in the lease very specific terms about how to forfeit your lease. Uh, terminated it prematurely, and the tenant doesn't follow those. So that could be a good argument for when the surrender is not consented to, 
On the opposite of surrender is abandonment. So this is gonna be a case by case kind of determination just because there is case law that just because a tenant is not paying rent and has not been seen in the property for a while does not mean they've abandoned it. Um, it might just mean they're in the hospital. So to advise your landlord clients properly, um, you know, if you believe that the unit has been abandoned, send a letter, you know, mail them, contact them, get proof in writing of, of trying to contact them saying, you know, if you abandon this property, I intend to terminate your lease. And that could be great language to include in your lease writing. So it's very clear between the parties what their obligations are and when the unit is considered abandoned. Sculptatory clauses, uh, plain language, aka releases from liability. This, um, most of you are probably going to be better off at writing these, these clauses than anyone in our office because we're usually on the tail end of them. Um, but be aware that, you know, contract adhesion, if these are grossly unfair to the tenant, if you're signing away all your rights to negligence and injury, even in public shared spaces of the unit, like the hallways and the walkways out front and everything like that, um, they might not be upheld. So the, the biggest thing I guess we also see is that the landlord tries to contract away their right to uh, fire safety ordinances like fire detectors. There's case law out there that uh, failure to include fire de um, smoke detectors, sorry, smoke detectors. Um, failing to include those is a violation and can result in negligence. And that brings on a whole other type of damages a uh, tenant could, could demand for, so. Okay, uh, subletting, this is gonna be more uh, for people who write leases to college students. Um, also, I've seen great uh, lease language for when you have, I'm thinking of college students, but um, lease language when you write a lease for individual tenants. So maybe they're sharing a shared common area, but they have four bedrooms. To avoid issues with subletting and assignments to people for over the summer and whatnot, um, and you'd have to have all four of them sublet their interest, um, have each individual student sign their own lease with you for that room and shared area. Um, and being aware of explaining what subletting and assignment and the differences in the lease so that way an average person can, can understand it. Uh, use and occupancy. So occupancies is going to be those local ordinances, bedrooms to persons, uh, but you will also have issues with who the tenant can bring over to the premise and what are those people doing. So obviously use is going to be residential for these situations. Um, if the tenant is bringing people over that are doing illegal activities, there's case law that the tenant is not necessarily strictly liable for those other guests doing illegal activities. So this is not the tenant doing them, obviously. That's going to be a separate uh, illegal actions. Uh, utilities. There's a lot here because it's a common issue. Um, I put the e-wrap up on there because uh, we see very often now that when landlords re were requesting emergency rental assistance program funds during the pandemic, um, maybe the lease they had said that the landlord's responsible for all these utilities, but then they found out that e-wrap will pay for them if the tenant's responsible for them. So they're writing new leases or doing you know, having verbal agreements with the tenants about what, who's responsible for what. Um, so if you have a landlord coming to you and they're saying the tenant, the tenant hasn't paid these bills, you know, this is an issue to be aware of. Ask if they received ERAP, ask STEP or the housing authority for a copy of what was received, just so you're clear on who's responsible for utilities. Um, best case scenario, if you're renting a premise, it's separately metered if there's multiple units in it, and then each unit will pay for their own utilities. If a premise, if a lease department has mul just um, multiple units, but it's not separately metered, it's 
simplest and best for your client to assume those charges and then calculate them out per unit. Um, we could have a whole hour about just how to do that, <laughs> but um, for, for cleanness and proving damages, those would be the best way to separate um, utilities on a lease. Um, know that there's also an act called USTRA. So this, when a landlord isn't responsible for utilities and then fails to pay them, tenants can actually unite together, pay that to you know, restore electric, restore water, and then sue the landlord for damages. It very explicitly gives tenants the right to do this, whether or not the tenant's names are on that utility bill or not. Another good one. <laughs> that everyone doesn't know what to do with, right? Pets versus service animals. Um, you can demand, obviously, a security deposits for pets. Um, if you're doing that, if your landlord wants to collect an extra fee because of a pet, be very explicit that the pet fee is not part of the security deposit, or maybe it is, but make sure um, that's pretty clearly written out because that security deposit, like, like if you're calling it a security deposit, it then falls under that statute and you're gonna be responsible for returning it and interest and all that. So if you just want a one-time pet fee or a month-to-month -month pet fee, make sure it's labeled as such. So service animals, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, this is service animals who are trained to, you know, help seeing eye dogs, stuff like that. Um, they explicitly state they're only dogs and they, they are not emotional support animals. They are the well-trained um, and they can, so uh, those kind of service animals under the ADA can, uh, are required to be allowed into public based places. You can't charge security deposit for an ADA seeing eye dog. Um, they're not considered pets. They are a service animal. Um, this is why you'll see on restaurants that like a seeing eye dog allowed all other dogs, no pets allowed. Um, those are the differences. So if it's an ADA dog for someone with a disability, and that can be physical, you can visually see the disability or it can be a mental disability. If they have a service animal dog for that, they cannot be excluded. You cannot charge a security pet for them, deposit for them. But more often what we see are what people call emotional support animals. Um, this would be more under the Fair Housing Act, and you cannot prohibit someone with a disability from having a assistance animal. So these are going to be your dogs, your cats, um, you know, we've all seen ducks and pigs or who knows what. Um, there's no clear language on what kind of pet is or is not allowed. Um, it's just based off that tenant's disability. So if your landlord tries to evict them based off their assistance animal, they are evicting them based on a disability under the Fair Housing Act. With that being said, um, there is no specific language about what a doctor needs to write in order to assert that an animal is an assistance animal and not a pet. Um, most often you'll see on a doctor's letterhead Susie has a gray cat um, named, you know, gray kitty that is her emotional support animal due to her PTSD. Um, and then they sign it at the bottom. That's, that's, they can say may benefit from a cat and not describe the animal. Um, it's best that they do, but there's really no strict statute or court case out there just when it falls under or not under an assistance animal. Um, there is case law out there that they don't have to be specifically trained, so they don't have to be like a seeing eye dog, and that goes for emotional support pets and assistance pets. So regardless of what role they're playing or how serious you feel they're assisting in the disability, they, the case law shows that it does not matter as long as they have a doctor's note. fees and costs. Um, this comes into play, obviously, if you're trying to evict a tenant, best practice to put it in the lease. So under Pennsylvania law, if you don't put in 
a cost expense or attorney's fees, you cannot demand them in a court case. It has to be expressly stated in the lease what damages can be collected by each party. Bain v. Smith was pretty substantial because it held that if they are equally applicable to both parties. So if your lease says the prevailing party or both parties may be entitled to attorney's fees in the case of a, an eviction court case, that's been held to be fine because obviously only one party is going to win at the end. <laughs> if you have it just for the landlord, we say only the lessor is entitled to attorney's fees and court costs upon the filing of a court case, that's going to be contract adhesion. You know, the tenant's not being freely bargained for, it's not a neutral term, and it's going to be wiped out. So, so long as that term is neutral and equally applied, um, they will be enforceable. Right of entry. Um, this is going to get into uh, kind of the covenant of quiet enjoyment, but know that a tenant has exclusive possession as soon as they take possession of the unit. If your landlord wants to enter the building, make sure there's express language for situations that would apply in the lease. Um, that there is some case law about you know emergency situations and for maintenance and repair. Um, that's understandable, but it's best to put in that, that language in the lease. And fitting into care and maintenance, that's going to bring us to the warranty of habitability. So Proving Homes um, was the establishing case for Pennsylvania for the warranty of habitability. It is just chocked full with citations and what to do in, in all the situations. Um, it doesn't necessarily give a detailed list of what's considered habitable versus unhabitable, um, but it does give some language about it being means for basic human sanitation, uh, basic uh, living conditions. Um, Beasley, it, the case Beasley there uh, was for vermin or infestations. And then Fair v. Negley found that the warranty is not waivable. So you can try to write it and waive it in a, in a case, but that's gonna be a void clause in the lease. Okay. So I'll, I'm gonna stay on to the right side of the screen because uh, when a tenant wants to, uh, to enforce the warranty of habitability, there are prerequisites according to homes about what they have to do. So the landlord has to have notice of that defect and they have to have the opportunity to repair it. Um, these are not clear or fully explained, but notice can be in writing, preferred obviously, uh, but that's not required technically. So if the landlord lives next door and you all lose power, clearly the landlord also knows of the issue um, and the opportunity to repair. And that's gonna be, depend on uh, what the issue is and the efforts the landlord's making to repair it. If there is a breach of the warranty of habitability, tenants have a couple options. The numbers one through five are included in homes. Uh, the ones after that have been upheld afterwards. So there's no requirement that the, the tenant has to wait until the landlord starts fixing things to try to enforce these um, remedies. So if the tenant's given notice, given time to cure, there's been no action, they can proceed with these. They can terminate the lease. They can repair and deduct. That's going to be limited to how much the tenant pays the landlord for rent. Um, if it's an annual lease, it's going to be that annual amount. If it's a monthly lease, it's going to be that monthly amount. Uh, they can bring a suit for damages. So it's going to be based on the amount of the unit that is considered inhabitable or uh, the extra fees and extra costs they may have had to have because of the, the unhabitable part of the home. So that could be running the space heaters extra because there's the furnace isn't working. Um, those kind of damages are going to be compensatory for whatever the tenant is spending to make up for the lack of cure. Um, specific performance and injunctive relief uh, our office has had a lot of success with this recently. Um, 
with specific landlords who are just failing to repair holes in the roof, rats, heat. You know, uh, the court has ordered them to make repairs within a certain time period um, and then failing to do so. So tenants can also withhold rent. This is separate than what people may know of as the Rent Withholding Act. Um, the Rent Withholding Act, it, is Pennsylvania law. It's adopted in like first and second class cities, um, but it's not necessarily um, applied where, where we live here in Tioga and Lycoming counties. Um, it is best practice if a tenant is withholding rent to have them withhold it in escrow. So having that money set off to the side and being able to show the court that because it's you're waiting to pay it upon cure. Um, declaratory judgment, this, is not authorized in homes, but the homes case does say all other contract remedies, so it can, can include this. And then a UTCPT claim, uh, that's going to be for very deliberate re failures or refusal to repair, um, and that's going to bring on those treble damages that can be uh, quite hefty at times. I'm going to skip over the covenant quiet enjoyment. Um, it's not too... Um, just, just know that if a tenant is wrongfully put through the eviction process, they will have a claim under the covenant quiet enjoyment because the landlord is um, infringing on their right to possession of the home. Okay, so breach of the lease. Oh, yes, please, Tim, go ahead. <laughs> I'll let Tim launch the second poll here. Make sure you click it if you want CLE credit. Um, so breaches, you can either, and this is for both parties normally, uh, you can have a civil suit for damages or you can terminate the lease and try to get possession returned to the landlord. Um, I'm gonna keep, we all know what covenants and conditions are after law school. Um, remedy we see very often, acceleration of rent, so the landlord can put in the lease that if you terminate early, you owe for the rest of that lease term. Uh, the landlord does have that contractual duty, that normal contract law duty to mitigate their damages. So the landlord cannot just sit there and not re-rent the unit and demand all the rest of the year's worth of rent. So they have to either just start trying to uh, re-rent the unit, mitigate that damage, or, um, and then only ask for that amount of unpaid rent from the ten former tenant. Self-help <laughs> repossession, um, obviously we know it's illegal. Don't do it. Don't advise people to just turn them out, uh, turn the electric off, turn the heat off, change locks. Um, there's plenty of case law on that out there. And if a good landlord comes to you beforehand, you know how to write that into the lease so it's not a concern for you. Um, there are three grounds under the, our local MDJ rules about when a landlord can seek eviction. So if you are writing a notice to quit, please include explicitly one of these three reasons. Um, notice the quits has to be very clear and not, not ambiguous whatsoever. So you need to say the lease has ended, you're not renewing it, you're saying there was a breach, here's what that breach was. Or if rent is due, you I've asked for it and you have not paid it. Uh, based on those reasons, you're gonna end up with one of these notice periods underneath from the statute. Um, going back to that, that you will see it's not because the landlord sold the property. So if you are selling the property, maybe it'd be best to say, we're not redoing your lease because we're selling the property. <laughs> um, that's the best way to make it very clear and saying you're not renewing it falls under one of those notices and actual reasons for eviction. Um, so the notice to quit can be waived in leases, but be very clear about that language. So you're not having any sort of uh, plain language required um, violations, but be aware there's case law out there. I mean, this one says without any notice whatsoever, and it was not a waiver of notice. So be very careful about how you're wording things 
And it's best practice to have that tenant and landlord sign off, you know, have it in big bold letters, have them initial by it so they're aware of that. If, um, and, and make sure the notices contain a clear and positive demand with a clear and positive date certain to be moved out. Um, there's case law out there that has a little, um, she wrote, P.S., don't worry about this. It's part of the real estate sale. And that was held to invalidate that notice to quit. So date certain, no wishy-washy. <laughs> um, and it also makes the judge's life a lot easier too, right? So when you file MDJ court for an eviction, um, it's very important that the reasons for eviction are included in that complaint. Um, proper notice, um, service, all of those things, make sure they're properly alleged. I know a lot of times people maybe send their landlords to do that part on their own, because um, it's not a very hard form, you would think. But tenants will have claims that they were not aware of what was being um, claimed against them if it's not written well in that complaint. Um, and if you have, um, maybe it's unclear for the landlord tenant, or maybe you have a family member who thinks they have some sort of interest in the home. If you have a lease, you know, rent to own situation, anything like that, that involves the dispute of ownership of that property, just start in, MD, uh, start in your court of common pleas, file an ejectment action, surpass MDJ altogether because that would not be proper jurisdiction for the MDJ court. Here's some, uh, just the laws that outline hearings and what's required for MDJ. Uh, be aware if there is not a proper notice and those plead, the complaint is not properly pleaded, the MDJ is not supposed to have subject matter jurisdiction over that case. Um, in the hearing, you know, the judges have the right to award a pay and stay. This is available for the tenant who's only being evicted on the basis of non-payment or rent. So there's no, those other two reasons have not been pled. This is only about non-payment or rent. The tenants would have the right to cure that default and avoid a order of possession being granted. So if this is awarded by the judge, the tenant is only required to pay the judgment amount. So if your case happens and some more rent is accrued after that judgment, that additional rent is not owed in order to, pay, to halt that order of possession. The order of possession can be stopped only by a full payment of what the MDJ awards. And that will include the cost and the last rent, but not the current rent. Okay, and time frame order of possessions can be after the 10th day of judgment and up until 120 days later. And the citations for that. Um, when a tenant, getting close to time, I know, but this is the fun stuff. Um, so when a tenant um, potentially loses or a landlord, they can do either one of them obviously can appeal to the court of common pleas. Uh, when a tenant appeals, they have the right to pay a supersedious bond. It's 10 days, they must have filed the appeal within 10 days, that's 30 days if they're a victim of domestic violence. So when they file and they want to stay, they have to pay rent to the pathonotary's office. And it's not gonna be to the landlord, it's gonna be to the pathonotary's office and they're gonna hold it until this case is settled. And then the landlord might get some money back, probably won't. Uh, for most people, they have to pay three months worth of rent, and it's going to be the rent based off of what's in the MDJ decision um, listed right there on that, on that judgment. For indigent persons, it's going to be one third of that monthly rent, and then they have to pay the two third within the next 20 days, and then everybody has to keep paying rent in full every 30 days. If they're only disputing, you know, in a normal, any other court case, if you're only disputing how much is owed, they have that 30 day deadline. When they appeal, most people obviously appeal de novo, but there is the option to do a writ of centurari. This is gonna be when there's very clear defects on the record at the MDJ level. Uh, most of the time you're gonna see this for lack of jurisdiction, uh, but it, just to know that is another option out there. 
Okay. And ejectment, that's going to be your court of common pleas case as you appeal it, or it's going to be um, court of common pleas, <laughs> or it's going to be when you start. Or you, you can just start here as well. Don't feel that you have to start at the MDG level. You can just start with a clear ejectment um, and maybe supersede, you know, surpass that, that bottom level. Okay, and then finally, what do you do when the tenant moves out? Um, this is, you know, a lot of people think the landlord thinks, you know, the tenant's gone, it's over, I don't have to worry about this anymore. And many of you probably know that's not true. So this is gonna be the same procedure whether the tenant is evicted by a court order or whether they vacate voluntarily. So when, I should also say, this is separate and apart from their security deposit. Uh, responsibilities. You can use the same letter if you want, to put them both in there, but this is a separate requirement than the security deposit. So once you get possession, once the landlord obtains possession, gets some keys, the tenant has 10 days to contact a landlord to ask about getting the rest of their belongings out of the house. If the tenant reaches out, the landlord has to hold them for 30 calendar days. If Sorry. We can get there. <laughs> um, a tenant, so if a tenant does not reach out within that 10 day period after returning possession, um, the tenant, the landlord should still give a written notice about the tenant's property. So it's really best to do it immediately. Don't even wait for the, land, the tenant to, to contact them uh, in that security deposit letter write about the security deposit, write about their personal property. You know, the landlord gets the keys and goes and sees there's still tons of stuff in the garage, anything. Um, send a notice to the tenant um, at their new address or at least the last known address, which is probably the unit and it'll get forwarded. You're still doing your due diligence. So write in the notice, you know, you have 10 days to contact me. If you don't contact me, you're, the property is deemed abandoned. But it's going to be 10 days from that letter's postmark date, not when the landlord writes it or not when the tenant receives it or when it was mailed. And then the tenant will have the obligation to respond and say, please store it, or if they don't respond. Um, and that's all in the Landlord Tenant Act, the language for this. Um, after that time period passes, then the landlord can deem the property abandoned. Be aware that there's gonna be an extended deadline for about this personal property for victims of domestic violence. And if this act is violated, it's going to result in trouble damages under that UTCP claim. Um, and there's damages claims under the Land or Tenant Act. So obligation not over until 30 days after they give it possession for sure. Um, the landlord is also allowed to charge storage fees under the act. The landlord is not allowed to withhold the property until they pay those storage fees. Okay, um, there is local case law on that, that if they're trying to get to it, you have to give it to them regardless if they pay the storage fees or not. Okay, we are to questions and I did see we had one about a dog bite. Um, that's going to depend a lot on the facts of the case. Um, it's going to depend on, you know, was the dog authorized? Did the landlord know about it? Was it in a common space? Was it another tenant? Was it a visitor? Um, and, and where the biting occurred? You know, was it in a unit? Was it out in the sidewalk? Was it in the yard with a shared space? Um, and those are the kind of things um, that the, the releases of the liability are going to be that contract language you want to look for. Um, without it, you're going to fall under regular landlord tenant law and that um, tenant duties and, and care and maintenance area or general PA negligence. Okay, I fit a lot into an hour. Does anyone else have questions? <laughs> All right. Well, everyone will get a copy of this presentation. Um, 
I try to fill it with citations as much as possible because I personally hate CLEs that tell you things, but not why. So um, if you have further questions after reading the cases, you want to uh, talk to me about them, feel free to. Um, but if we don't have any more questions, um, I will let you all go on to the rest of your Fridays. I hope you all have a good weekend and the smoke is uh, gone for us. <laughs> <laughs>